Last week, I was amazed at how many came out blizzard conditions. Blizzard conditions. And you were here. This morning, I get up. My uh, thermometer said 17 below. Did anybody have lower than that? 21 below? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was fierce out. And again, here you are. Thank you. Praise God for that, your desire to come, worship the Lord, hear from his word. Pastor Danny and Sue are on their way back after two weeks of vacation in Florida. Talked to them last night. They're in Paducah, Kentucky. How many of you have been in Paducah? Anybody? A few of you? Has anybody lived in Paducah? Okay, that's good because I think Denny and Sue, they, they won't have a desire to stay in Paducah. They'll, they're they're going to burst forth and say, Annadale looks good. <laughs> all right. New Sunday School quarter, we talked about that. Urge you all next week to please consider that. I want to start this week, set the stage for this message, again with a, a, a personal story from my life that God has spoken and worked in me. This one comes from a few years ago when my wife Diane and I were living in Minneapolis, Maple Grove. Specifically, I was working for a company by the name of Northrop King. Probably some of you recognize that name. It's a different name now. Uh, During that period, we had a little downturn. There were a few layoffs. I survived those, but I felt potentially more coming, you know, nipping at at the tail, so to speak. And so God urged me to maybe consider looking elsewhere for employment so I started looking around a little bit a company from Des Moines who knew me reached out to me had an interview had some talks Diane and I went down and visited Des Moines we really liked Des Moines looked like a city that would be warm and friendly quality of life good schools and such the job came through they presented a wonderful package for me and after much prayer Diane and I said yes God is leading us to move to Des Moines. Well, the day before we're to move down there, my new boss calls me up. We're having a wonderful conversation. He's looking forward to my arrival. We're talking about the things that he wants me involved in. And then the conversation went to our, my compensation package, which I thought was all ironed out. And he, he, he put a little something in there, a little change, shall we say, Surprise, yeah, uh uh-oh, Paul. (laughs) And I didn't know how to react. My emotions were high, and I hung up the phone, and, man, I was upset. I was upset. My pride was like, how dare they do that to me? We had a deal worked out. Praise God for a godly wife. Diane came, settled me down a little bit. We prayed, and we said, God has orchestrated this move. We need to trust him with this little teeny detail. And so we went ahead. But my pride almost shut the door. I so wanted to pick up that phone and say, the deal's off. I'm out of here. Minneapolis is, is staying home. Proceeding ahead, we had a wonderful time in Des Moines. I worked at a good, that company turned out to be a blessing. Had a nice home, great schools. New cars in the garage, a beautiful home. More importantly, God, as many of you know my story, God led us to, through this local evangelical free church, to get into missions 10 years in Brazil. Powerful time seeing God work in amazing, spectacular ways. Then back a time in Iowa again, and then here, miraculously coming to Annandale, Minnesota. Now I look back to roughly 20 years ago, And my pride could have put all that, could have stopped all that. My pride and my control. Praise God it didn't. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you desiring and needing to hear from you. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for each person who stepped in the door this morning. I pray that you would speak to each one of us individually on what we need to hear from you. I thank you for your powerful word, your word that changes lives. Use your spirit to speak to us. We thank you again. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. Last week, 
Last week we looked at the first 14 verses of this chapter, the story of Jesus at the house of a prominent Pharisees. As you remember, the Pharisees were looking to corner Jesus, to do what I call nail Jesus, while Jesus, on the other hand, he was trying to teach them, show them about their hard hearts and the ramifications of having a, a hard heart. Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath right in front of them, showing them that the man's needs of healing was so much more important than their cultural needs of the Sabbath, their rules. Today, this story is going to continue. Jesus is still at that same home of those Pharisees, prominent Pharisees, and his conversation with them continues. Will we look at verse 15 to get us going? When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. This is an amazing proclamation the man makes. Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. In light of the setting Jesus was in, you know, the judgmental Pharisees and all, these words of amazing truth had to be given to him through the Holy Spirit. My first, first thought was that this man really gets it. Heaven's going to be amazing, and we are in. He's speaking on behalf of his cohorts there. It says in the verse, he was one who was sitting at the table. So I think we're safe to assume that he also was a Pharisee. And again, I find it so interesting that he made this statement. Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. Why is it interesting? Now keep in mind that he's making this statement right after Jesus had just given them some of those hard punches, shall we say. First, no, we're going to look back quick to review those hard punches. First, he hammers them for not approving of Jesus healing a man with dropsy on the Sabbath. Telling them how terrible that their Sabbath culture is more important than this hurting man. Second, he hammers them for choosing the place of honor at a wedding, which he really is referring to heaven. He goes further and states that don't assume you're getting into heaven and that it takes humility to get to heaven. Lastly, he points out who are invited, the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. In other words, those who know they need Jesus. So either this man who makes this big statement is totally ignoring these statements that Jesus made or he truly gets it and says, we are blessed to get into heaven. Either way, this sets Jesus into a deeper mode of clarifying things and with some thunder. Verse 16, Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. Jesus once again jumps into story mode. The parable of the great banquet Jesus, as we know, is the master at telling story. His motive in telling stories is that his audience, at that time the Pharisees at the table with him, and us, because it's in the word of God, were meant to shape and transform our lives. When we read the word, we should always come away pondering. How should I live my life? These are great word pictures that stick in our simple minds, the parables. A question for you all. Uh, in fact, I hope it's from God. It's, I call it a Jeff question. Do you have times when you read God's word and it kind of kicks you in the gut? It challenges you. You know, you read something, you totally realize, I'm not doing this or I should be doing that. You're being convicted. If you're not having those times uh, somewhat on a regular basis when you read, I suggest you need to pray with God so that he will speak to you. Please know also that the Bible is full of encouraging things, not just always to kick us in the seat of the pants, though we often need that, don't we? Yeah. Back to the parable that Jesus is starting to tell. I love how he says, a certain man. He, of course, is talking about himself. Jesus, for sure, is a certain man, the Son of God. 
The Pharisees are blind to this fact, though he has told them and showed them this before. I want to jump back to a story in Luke 5. It's the story where Jesus is speaking to a group of people in a house and some friends bring their crippled friend with, can't get in there, so they drop him through the roof. Let's read this in Luke 5. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. So most of the Pharisees were there, or they were well represented, shall I say. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. What a deal, huh? Wow. When Jesus saw their faith, he said a very surprising thing. Friend, your sins are forgiving. So Jesus makes this big statement here, starting the process of telling them, the Pharisees, who he truly is, the Messiah, God who is able to forgive. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law begin thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. That last verse is so key. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. On top of that, he proves it that he is God by healing this paralyzed man. We're so blessed to have the whole word of God so we can understand exactly who Jesus means, that Jesus is the certain man. Let's go back to the table with the Pharisees and Jesus talking to them. Jesus then states that this certain man invites many to the banquet. The many here refer to the Jews. The prophet had foretold of the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. Now Jesus the Messiah was there and the Jews not only rejected him, but they also killed him. We see that the Jews are invited first. Jesus at the home of the Pharisees who are Jewish, who know the chosen ones of God. They, they are the Jews. He's reminding them. They have been invited. On top of that, he says, everything is now ready, meaning he's there. The Messiah is here. If we went back and looked at the prophecies of Jesus coming in the Old Testament, some believe there are over 300 of them, which these Jewish rulers knew as Pharisees, teachers of the law. They should have known Jesus was the certain man, the Messiah. Verse 17. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. When Jesus says that everything's ready, again, he means your Messiah is here. He stands before you now. Your redemption is here. We can learn from this too. We all have a time limit on responding to our invitation to heaven, that amazing gift of grace. You could say, what is your time for the banquet? Do you know? None of us know when our earthly lives will end. And we also don't know when those around us, you know our Frank group, will have their lives end here. Job 14.5 talks about this. A person's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits. He cannot exceed. Though God knows the days of each person, we for sure don't. But we must live as if the time for heaven is near. Soon it will be too late to respond to this amazing grace that only Jesus offers to us all and to our Frank's groups. 
verses 18 to 20. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The excuses begin one by one. They all were poor excuses. The first is that I've purchased a field, and so I need to go and see it. Kind of ridiculous, isn't it? Who purchases a field without first looking at it? In fact, if you needed to go see it, the field's going to be there tomorrow. Go tomorrow. How about the second one? He buys oxen and wants to go try them out. Pretty silly, pretty st stupid. Who buys oxen without first trying them out? That's like buying a car, a used car, without first driving it. Vince, have you sold many used cars where people didn't test drive them first? No. Uh -huh. The third is that they just got married and so they can't come. The wedding is done. Why not go? The reality is you just got married and you still have that joy that you want to share with all. Why wouldn't you go to a feast? Be out there with the pe people celebrating. One more feast? Sure, let's go. Yeah, we're in. All of them are pretty poor excuses. I would say ridiculous excuses. How about us? What are the excuses for our day? I did some research and I kind of came up with a few of them that I found out that society feels like our big excuses, the top three for why we don't give our lives to Jesus. Number one is a life with Jesus will end our life of fun and sin. The second is they, we believe they, we can handle life on our own. They want to be in control at all times. Nobody's going to tell me how to live my life. We want to go to the grave singing, I did it my way. Pride and control, huh? Third, many believe that God would not forgive a terrible person like them. This one I can understand a little, though it's a lie from the devil. And sometimes just an excuse to get them back to reason number one, you know, having fun in their sin. I personally think the number one excuse in the USA is a pursuit of what we call the American dream. We want the whole package of life on earth, and we are willing to work long hours, do whatever it takes to get it. A nice house, a good job, nice cars, maybe a good wife or husband, a few fun toys and more. Let's not forget our sports. We seem to think that when we get such and such, or we do such and such, then and only then will we be happy. When we get this, then maybe we can squeeze a little time into for God. These things are not bad in themselves, but when they become our idols before God, trouble starts, and certainly our ability to go to God gets blocked. Let me ask you a hard question. If God nudged you, would you be willing to sell your house? He had a purpose behind that. I think the second reason we battle is pride. Nobody wants to admit it. I cannot do it on my own. I need a savior. We often have the mentality, I'll get my life in order then I will pursue God. Truth is, God is the one who puts our life in proper order. Amen? I talked to a lot of you out there who get frustrated with people in your lives, your frank groups, that seemingly are not open to the gospel. 
I totally get that. I have people in my life who are in that situation too. We need to remember what it says in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God's patient with us all, so we need to be patient with others. I know my story of coming to Jesus and walking with him, and I know many of your stories out there. God was and still is patient with each one of us. On the other hand, we all have to be ready and alert. His word calls us for that. As God commands us, asking God for open doors and looking ones to share that hope we have. A great way to open a door is by asking easy questions to people about their lives. Draw them out. You'll blow them away when you ask them questions about their lives. When it comes to our children, how about that? Our spouses who need Jesus, we need to totally surrender them to God. This means that you have to release them to him, allowing him to do whatever it takes to bring that person to the saving knowledge of Jesus. This can mean job loss, health problems, short of death. How about relationships broken, even financial crash? Whatever it takes, maybe even prison. This can be a scary thing. Lord, do whatever it takes to reach my husband, my brother, my sister, my son, my daughter, or whoever. Another question for you, us. Do you believe that salvation is that important that you're willing for anything to happen to that person short of death so that they may come to the saving grace? Do you truly believe that? It's that important. It all comes back to these verses we're reading and the need to lose the lame excuses. The consequences are heartbreaking and devastating. Matthew 13, 42 speaks to this. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I've been with several people who have the courage to ask people when they're sharing with them about the gospel, what is stopping you from turning your life over to Jesus? What is that barrier into your, in your life? Getting down to that nitty-gritty with them, getting it out in the open. Let's talk about it. Verse 21, the servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Again, this applies to God's anger toward the Jews rejecting Jesus. Now he tells them to go to the streets and alleys of the towns. He's saying to the Jews who are not practicing Jews, or in other words, they're not in that inner circle. That's who he's talking about. Go to the, that group. Again, we can learn from this word picture that Jesus gives us. We are called to go out. This means we have to get out of our place of comfort to reach the lost. Go to where our Frank group is at. I don't know about you, but for me, it's really comfortable. It's great. It's awesome coming to church. I love coming here. The encouragement the love, the joy, the opportunity to praise and worship our Lord and Savior be with you all. It's awesome. Being inside this building, though, is very safe. So God calls us at times to go out into the streets and alley. What are those streets and alleys for us? It's our workplaces. It's our neighbor's yard, maybe. Our dining room, a restaurant. Lots of them. You don't have to leave the United States. You don't have to leave the state of Minnesota. You don't even have to leave the town you live in. But you do have to leave this building at times. 
It's a thrilling experience to take the blessed hope we have to places that are not comfortable, emotionally safe, places that make us feel uncomfortable. Eric Marks goes to the care center once a month, roughly. Shares the hope there. They have a worship service there. People from all types of backgrounds. Thank you, Eric. We need to go to the streets and alleys. You want to honor Jesus? You want to be obedient? Jesus also talks in these verses that we need to focus on the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Again, great word pictures for us. The poor are those who do not have Jesus. And so their lives are poor. They don't have the joy, the rich blessings of the Lord. You know, that peace, that comfort, that hope of eternity, and so much more. You know people like that? Another question, does your life show the abundance that Jesus offers? The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and more. Do the lost see that you're thrilled that Jesus is in your life? Maybe the best way to impact the lost is to show them the fruit of the Spirit in your life. When they see that displayed in you, it's a matter of time before they want to hear about what you have that they don't have. Do you ever stop and do a little self-examination? Go to Galatians 5, 22 and 23 and read about the fruit of the Spirit. Consider how you're doing on each of those. I do that once in a while. It's convicting. It's encouraging. It's encouraging because there's such power in those. Or if you have the courage, maybe go to a brother or sister in the Lord, or maybe your spouse, and ask them, how, am I, how are you doing in those areas? Interesting story from this past week. I was blessed to go and serve at the mental health facility again. I met with a group of people, and I, after I was done, I came out into a big open room before leaving where a lot of the patients were at, some of the psychiatrists, counselors, and such. And this young lady who I didn't know was across the room, and suddenly she yelled out in this really loud voice, Jesus is Lord! Jesus is Lord! And then she said, you love Jesus! And she's, she's talking to me across the room. You love Jesus! And it was, kind of, it was very startling. I went to her, gave her a big hug, but it created this commotion. I was shocked about it. God works in amazing ways sometimes. The cripple and the lame are a great symbol of those who are unable to walk in life because life has crushed them without Jesus as their Savior. They're damaged from life. I'm not talking physically damaged, but emotionally damaged. Though at times it can grow to physical damage. Satan's destruction is head to toe. Spiritual, emotional, and physical. God's word testifies to this truth in John 10.10. 10. The blind are those who are lost without Jesus. They l live lives of making terrible decisions because they don't have the Lord's wisdom in his ways from his word to help us through life, to help us walk that straight path. Again, do you know people like that? <laughs> Last week I talked about how we need to see these people. They're right in front of us. Like the man with dropsy was right in front of Jesus, was right in front of the Pharisees. Interesting, someone asked me this week, what do you think the key is to be able to see the lost? I could talk for hours on this subject, but I'd prefer to boil it down to three simple things. I want to start with giving a disclaimer that I don't see the lost like Jesus does. I see them better than I used to, and I pray I'll see them better as I go forward than I do now. Number one, 
God has to be working inside of us. Our relationship with Jesus has to be what I call hot, on fire. Number two, simple, learn from Jesus. Take in these stories. There's some amazing stories in the Bible how Jesus did relationship with these people. How he talked with them. The third, do it in the power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there, available for us. He is ready and he is willing. Are we? Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. You'll not be disappointed. We need to start by seeing them. They're out there everywhere. Verse 22 and 23. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. Many theologians believe this is Jesus foretelling that we Gentiles now, be, now are being offered salvation as it spells out in the book of Acts. In verse 21, he talks about the streets and alleys. This is referring to the Jews who are not in that, again, practicing or in the inner circle. In this verse, it talks about the roads and the country lanes. This is referring to beyond the Jews. Go to the world, go to the Gentiles. I you praise God for that. That he decided to offer his amazing grace to us lowly Gentiles. Again, there's much to learn from these word pictures. We start where Jesus says, so that my house may be full. 1 Timothy 2.4 Who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth? There isn't a single person that God does not want saved. Nobody. He wants the knowledge of truth, the gospel, to be presented to everyone, which is our job to make disciples, teach the word in season and out. I praise God for the wonderful teachers we have here at Heartland, for the mentors and disciple makers too. This is a huge part of the work we have here, the biggest part, making disciples. It's very time consuming, but powerful, life changing. God wants his house full. Are we doing our part in this? For God so loved everyone in the world. How about us? Do we love them? Not easy, is it? Remember, God can use each one of us in so many different ways. He so created it. Created each of us uniquely, gifted us. Verse 24. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. This is a harsh, strong, clear finish to this story that Jesus makes. He's telling the group of Pharisees that because you rejected me, you are not going to taste of the great banquet. Your great pride is stopping you from entering heaven. Again, heartbreaking stuff. Think about the man who at the beginning of this story made the declaration, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. What was he thinking after Jesus laid out these powerful truths to him? His mind had to be in a big jumble. I close with this. This passage we studied brought hope. As it talked about heaven awaiting this great feast, this great banquet. But it was also a very sobering one, especially to the proud and judgmental as the Pharisees were. Matthew 12, 30 speaks to that. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters we learned from this passage that Jews were invited first but they rejected him 
The time of heaven is near. The Messiah is here. He is here today. The offer is standing. We need to lose the lame excuses for turning our lives over to him. Us believers need to go to the street and alleys to invite the lame, crippled, and the blind. God wants his house full. It's time to feast. The banquet is ready. We see it in the signs. We're in the time of the signs. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us. Again, Lord, I pray for each person here, starting with myself. May we have learned from your word. May we apply it to our lives. May it embolden us. May we see the urgency of this offer of the great banquet, heaven, the gift of mercy, forgiveness of sins, when we confess you are Lord and Savior, that you died and you rose again. I'm a sinner saved by your grace alone. May we go wherever it is you want us to go to bring that message, whether it's standing in the yard of a neighbor having a conversation or at the restaurant or in our living room or at our workplace, all those. Embolden us, Lord. Use your spirit upon us. Take away any fear. May we know that when we share, it honors you. Lord, right now I want to pray. If there's anyone here today that hasn't made that commitment, that hasn't decided I'm a sinner and I repent of my sins, I need you as my Savior, Lord Jesus. You died in the cross for me. You rose again to conquer death. I want you to be my Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We give you all glory and honor. Amen. Dave? Would you please join me in uh, our closing hymn, hymn 473, Make Me a Blessing. sunshine. 